Okay, I'm going to uh, talk again today about the uh, fundamental lemma. Uh, last time, uh, we talked about the uh, proof of the fundamental lemma in positive characteristics, uh, but there are reasons for wanting the fundamental lemma uh, for fields of characteristic zero as well. Uh, and uh, the reason is that there are lots of nice applications in number theory to the fundamental lemma uh, in characteristic zero. I'll, I'll just, uh, uh, I didn't have time last time to uh, go over the list of some of the applications. I'll just state a few of them now. Um, of course, uh, an early application of the uh, fundamental lemma. And when I say application of the fundamental lemma, I'm not saying that these are corollaries of the fundamental lemma. I'm saying that uh, the fundamental lemma is one ingredient combined with the trace formula uh, in papers that often run hundreds of pages uh, to prove various results. Where, but the fundamental lemma is some ingredient in the proof, and often it's an unavoidable um, part of the proof uh, given our current technology. So uh, an early success was uh, the proof of uh, Fermat that uses uh, the fundamental lemma for uh, base change for GL2. Uh, this is a, a just a, a special case of the fundamental lemma for uh, two by two uh, cases. And this was uh, computed directly by Langlands in his book, uh, Base Change for GL2. This led to the Langlands Tunnel Theorem, which gets used then in the proof of Fermat. Uh, a, a second application, uh, the Sato-Tate conjectures for elliptic curves over uh, totally real fields. Uh, this is work due to several authors. Uh, I've mentioned uh, in my first talk Arthur's work on classification of representations of uh, poietic groups, of uh, 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 classical groups, uh, both uh, in the automorphic theory and the local theory. Um, uh, calculations of the Shimura, uh, cohomology of Shimura varieties, uh, for instance, the work of Morel and Shin, um, work by uh, Bargava, Schenker, Skinner, showing that a positive fraction, 66, at least 66% of all elliptic uh, curves over Q satisfy the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjectures. Uh, so all of these are making use of the fundamental lemma, not in positive characteristic, but in characteristic zero. And so what we want is a way, so the, the geometry that we discussed last time was uh, extremely useful, in fact, indispensable in giving the proof of the fundamental lemma uh, in positive characteristic. But we now want to move that result uh, back to characteristic zero. So this is moving in terms of uh, Frankel's uh, uh, description of the different columns of, uh, of representation theory. Uh, column one was characteristic zero. Column two was positive characteristic function fields. Uh, columns three and four I won't worry about in my lectures, but today we're going to go back and forth, show how to go move results back and forth between columns one and two from characteristic zero mm -hmm. to positive characteristic. So uh, the approach that I'm going to describe is based on uh, motivic integration. So that will be a uh, large part of the talk today. So last time was fundamental lemma. Or uh, fields of positive characteristic. Uh, but it's uh, a theorem that fundamental lemma holds for all piatic fields of characteristic zero. So this was an identity, as you recall from last time, we're taking on one side orbital integrals on uh, a group or Lie algebra, and we're taking K 
cap uh, some linear combinations of those uh, integrals, and then we're taking the orbital integral of the characteristic function of, uh, in the Lie algebra, the integer points, um, and we're relating that to Q to some power. This is going to be an orbital integral depending on a parameter A, and uh, we'll have a stable orbital integral on the other side, it collapses down to some smaller group. Okay, so the identity is something of this form. And uh, this really has two parts. Uh, first, uh, lift to characteristic zero uh, in sufficiently large residue characteristic and then the second part is to extend to all residue characteristics uh, so these two parts use quite different arguments uh, this part is the part that I'll describe today and this is based on motivic integration. And uh, this part I won't talk about today, but it's based on the trace formula. Uh, so I've said that uh, the fundamental lemma is sort of the, the smallest amount of identities that you need to put uh, the trace formula in working order. And once you can do this, uh, uh, prove the fundamental lemma for all fields of sufficiently large residue characteristic, you're allowed to start using the trace formula. And you can then use the trace formula, I won't show how this argument goes, but then to extend the fundamental lemma to all places uh, for all elements of the Heck algebra, and not just the unit element. Uh, so uh, I'll give a bit of a background on the idea of uh, motivic integration. Um, so I should say that this result uh, has been uh, proved by Volsberger uh, uh, not using motivic integration. And then there's also uh, this proof by Cluckers, myself, and Lozer using motivic integration. So I won't be talking about this approach. I'll be talking about uh, the approach based on motivic integration. Um, so what is motivic integration? Uh, the idea of motivic integration is that it should somehow be a universal theory of integration that's independent of the piatic field. So uh, in general, you, you start with a locally compact field, and then you do integration on that field. This is an attempt, if you want to, you could think of it as a, an axiomization, if you want, or a set of all the rules that you need to do integration that are expressed in a way that's independent of the ground field. And then uh, you do your integration inside this universal theory. And then for any given piatic field that you're provided, you plug in the field in the end to get the uh, answer for what the integral is for that particular field. So that's uh, the basic idea. Uh, so we want to so I'll just say it's a universal integration. fields, and I'll uh, try to make this more precise as we go through. Um, so integrals take values in a specially uh, constructed ring um, so I'll have some object X, for now think of X as uh, just uh, something like a, a variety. Uh, later this is going to become 
uh, what we call a definable subassignment. But for now, just think of this as a variety. And this is going to be uh, the collection of uh, integrable functions, say, on x. And then uh, we'll have the collection of integral functions on a point. And integration consists of taking something in this ring of uh, functions that we want to integrate and doing some sort of integration along a fiber. Uh, if we have x, some morphism from x down to a point, we'll have some sort of integration along a fiber operation that will give a value here. OK, so that's uh, the general setup. And then for each piatic field, We're going to have, uh, and if I have a, a function, so there's going to be a specialization of uh, this now to an actual function on an actual piatic object. So this is going to be f is going to be, uh, I'll have to say what this is, but we're going to take the f points of this object, and we're going to then have an ordinary q-valued function. And then uh, when I do the integration abstractly, so I'll have this abstract integral, that's going to take values over here, and I can specialize that. And that's going to be a function on a point. And so that's just going to be an element of Q. And what we want is uh, for all f of sufficiently large residue characteristic We want the ordinary piatic integral over f to equal this abstract integral specialized down to the field f. Okay, so this is the type of identity that we want. And then what we're going to do is uh, take the fundamental lemma and we're going to write it abstractly in terms of this universal theory, in terms of this uh, motivic integration. And so we'll have a statement of the fundamental lemma here. Uh, we'll have this identity that says that uh, this abstract statement of the fundamental lemma specializes uh, for all fields of sufficiently large characteristic to the ordinary statement of the fundamental lemma. And this is going to, uh, this specialization to the various local fields is going to be done in such a way, so uh, this will be defined in such a way Uh, that if uh, two fields have the same <coughs> residue characteristic, uh, we have, let me state this as a, as a theorem. So this is a theorem with Cluckers and Moser uh, for all f in this uh, uh, ring of functions that I'm integrating over some parameter space lambda. There exists an n uh, such that um, 
f of 1 equals 0 if and only if f of 2 equals 0 for all fi of residue characteristic bigger than n uh, if their residue fields are the same. Um, so uh, what this is saying uh, is that this uh, specialization map is going to be done in such a way that if you see how these integrals are set up, it'll be pretty evident that uh, this really only depends on the field through the residue field. And so you get the same answer uh, when two fields have the same residue field. And so we can apply this now. So what we do is, uh, well, with the fundamental lemma, uh, there are these parameters, uh, A, I didn't write it on the right-hand side, uh, but the integrals are depending on a parameter A. And I'm going to let that A run over a parameter space lambda. Uh, so we'll be able to apply this theorem to show that if the fundamental lemma holds for one field, and if we have the same residue field, then it also holds for the field F2. And here we can pick F1 to be a field of positive characteristic for which the fundamental lemma is known. And here we'll pick the F2 to be a field of uh, characteristic 0 that has the same residue field. And applying the fact that uh, these identities hold uh, in one field, if and only if they hold in the other field, uh, we'll get the fundamental lemma in characteristic 0 as well. Okay, so that's uh, a very rough sketch of uh, the strategy or the proof of lifting results from positive characteristic to characteristic zero. Yes? Excuse me? I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Um, so, so this is... So we should think of, um, in terms of the fundamental lemma, the integrals are going to depend on some parameter space. So the orbital the integrals are going to be something here. And then to do the integration, we're going to take functions here and integrate them down to the parameter space. And so I don't need to write an integral explicitly here. This is already after the integration has so, so this is going to be some integral of some other f prime. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, so just a word about these two proofs. Uh, so Valsberger has a proof. And there's this other proof by motivic integration. You know, the, these two proofs are dressed up very differently. They, you know, from the outside, they, they look like, you know, completely different methods are being used. But if you sort of dig down into the details of both of these proofs, I think fundamentally the, these are somehow the, the same proof. But uh, Valsberger's proof is longer because it doesn't use any of the tools of motivic integration, but in some sense, to first order approximation, he's, he's developing an abstract theory of integration, a motivic integration, if you want, in the context of the fundamental lemma. And uh, so uh, if you look at that paper, uh, a number of techniques are, are quite similar. Uh, I should also say that um, the fundamental lemma is just one example of this general theory of transferring uh, results from one characteristic to another. 
Uh, it's now been used in uh, various other contexts to, uh, and there are a lot of different fundamental lemmas. It's been done for the weighted fundamental lemma. Uh, it's been uh, done for uh, uh, fundamental lemmas that come up in the context of a relative trace formula. And if you want to go to the other side, you have orbital integrals on one side of the trace formula, you have characters on the other. Uh, in uh, recent work by uh, Cluckers, Gordon, and Holubchik, uh, they've uh, used uh, motivic integration techniques to uh, move results about characters of representation from uh, characters. They go the other direction. They, they use results of Harishandra that's, that are known in characteristic zero, and then they use motivic integration to move these results uh, to positive characteristic where the results were not known, uh, results about local integrability of uh, characters and so forth. Uh, so it's uh, uh, turning into quite a, a powerful and useful method of uh, moving uh, various results in harmonic analysis on these groups from one, uh, from one field to another. Okay, so let me uh, try to uh, now flesh this out a little bit more. Um, So, today I'm going to think of algebraic geometry as sort of the uh, model theory of the first order language of rings. Um, So suppose we just have a variety over Z, say. Uh, we can think of it a, as a functor that uh, applied to uh, a ring R uh, gives the set of points with values in the ring R. And what is a ring? Well, we can think of it abstractly in terms of uh, we've got a multiplication symbol, we've got an addition symbol, we've got a zero, we've got a one, and they satisfy uh, certain axioms. And so we can make uh, an abstract first order language of rings And what this is going to be is just all syntactically correct formulas that we can build out of multiplication, addition, 0, and 1. And together with uh, the usual uh, logical symbols, so I'll include uh, equality and then conjunction disjunction, negation, universal quantifiers, existential quantifiers, and so forth. Um, and then an actual ring, R, is just a structure for this abstract uh, first order language where we're interpreting this abstract uh, function symbol concretely in terms of the multiplication on that uh, particular ring. We're interpreting the addition as addition on that particular ring and so forth. So the idea of what we'd like to do now is uh, we want to extend algebraic geometry uh, 
by adding in more than just addition and multiplication. We're going to add in a couple of extra functions and then uh, repeat. Okay, so um, so let's add. Two more functions, and we'll get some sort of uh, extended algebraic geometry. And the two functions that I want to add are uh, ORD and angular com component. So um, if I have, for instance, uh, well, let's just take uh, formal power series, uh, formal Laurent series. Um, if I have an element here, uh, let's say with A sub N non-zero, I have a valuation map or ORD taking this to uh, this index n, the first non-vanishing coefficient. This is just uh, the valuation on this field. And then I also have the angular component that on this uh, same element is going to pick out the leading coefficient of the expansion. So this uh, angular component uh, is just going to pick out the A sub n. But just as in the case of rings, we can have uh, a formal language and then we can have lots of different structures with, uh, and each of them will have their own multiplication and addition rules. We can have lots of different fields with uh, an ORD and an angular component map. Uh, for instance, I could replace the complex numbers here with any field. And I would similarly, uh, I would have these two functions. Or I could take a piatic field. Um, so we could take, uh, for instance, QP. into Z, and this is just the usual valuation. So I'll send uh, P, P I to I, and we have an angular component going from the non-zero elements down into the residue field uh, that picks out uh, if I have an element x times p to the i, where x is a unit, I can take that unit mod p and get an element of the residue field. So this gives an angular component map. So what we can do is form a first order language that includes ring operations, but it also includes these two functions. So, so the Deneff POS language is the first order language. with uh, the angular component and ORD. Now, there is a difference. So when we have a structure here, uh, the multiplication is a binary operation on R, and it takes R cross R into R. But with the ORD and the angular component, they're going from one different, here we're going from 
the field into the integers. And here we're going from the field into the residue field. And so here we really just have one different object giving the structure. But to describe things here, we have three different objects that come up in building this structure. We have the, the field, we have the residue field, and we have the value group where the ORD takes values. So this is what's called a three-sorted language. The structure has got to give uh, three different objects, the valued field, the residue field, and the value group. So this is a three-sorted language. So it has uh, a valued field, residue field, and value group. So in specifying a structure, we need to give all of these three. And when we have a, univer when we have a universal or existential quantifier or a variable of any sort, I need to say which of these three types of variables it is. So it could be a variable running over the field, it could be a variable running over the residue field, or it could be a variable running over the integers or the value group. So we have uh, three types of quantifiers and variables. Uh, so I won't be specific about this, but we take uh, the ring language uh, for the, the valued field, we take the ring language for the residue field, we take uh, the additive uh, uh, language uh, for the value group. We don't allow multiplication here. And then we add in these two function symbols, and we get a language. So now the idea is to do algebraic geometry um, using this rather than this. And we just build up everything as before. So. So um, our three sorts of variables. So if I have a formula phi, I can say that its type is M and an R, where this is a triple. And this uh, this will be the number of free variables in the formula of the first type, and then n will be the number of free variables in the formula of this type, and r will be the number of free variables in the formula of this type. So. And so then attached to a formula, we should think of this as the analog now as a collection of polynomials. And to get uh, a variety, we take the zero set of a collection of polynomials. Now we're going to take, uh, for any phi, I'm going, um, so let's fix a field uh, k of characteristic zero. And then for any field k containing k, I can let vk be the solutions uh, or the, the values satisfying phi in, well, for the uh, field itself, I'll take uh, the formal Laurent series with coefficients in k. And then for the residue field, I'll just use uh, 
the residue field of that. And then for the integers, I'll use C. OK, so we think of this now as the analog of the R points of a variety. And for any formula, then, I get what is called a definable subassignment. It's something that assigns to every field K containing little k the set of solutions inside this set. So B is definable. Subassignment. Uh, so it's called this. Uh, let me give a couple of examples. Uh, uh, we're just going to fix a field little k of characteristic zero. It'll be fixed throughout the discussion. Um, so a couple of examples. Uh, I can pick, uh, for instance, if I pick phi to be the formula, uh, there exists y such that y squared equals x, where x is a variable of type. So I'll have this be a formula of type 1, 0, 0. So I'll have this uh, formula uh, over the uh, uh, valued field. Then uh, the corresponding V of K. So X is going to be a valued field variable. So it's going to be, uh, and then I'll add in, uh, let's say X is not equal to zero. This is just going to be the set of elements that are a square for the set of solutions that are non-zero. So it would be something like this for every k. Uh, so you see that we can get things that are not uh, varieties in the, the usual sense. Or I could take phi to be the formula uh, ord of x is bigger than 0. And uh, by the way it's written, it's clear that x here has to be of the valued field sort. And then v of k will be all of the elements of uh, ord greater than or equal to 0. So that would just be the formal power series. Well, I could take the elements in the residue field that are not a square. That would be given by a formula. Um, and notice that if I go, so I have k and k, if I go up to an algebraic closure, well, the set of elements in an algebraic closure that are not a square would be the empty set. But this, in general, could be non-empty. And so if I have a morphism, if I go from k, the inclusion, k into the algebraic closure, I don't get a map from vk into vk bar. So I don't get a functor. That's why I'm using the word subassignment rather than functor, because since we allow negations, the sets can get smaller as uh, the field gets bigger. Okay, so we don't have something like this.
So then we can form a category where the objects are these subassignments and the morphisms are morphisms whose graph is also a subassignment. Objects definable subassignments and morphisms functions whose uh, graph is a definable. We get a category of all definable subassignments uh, with this given base field K, and there's a relative version that we can do as well. If I fix a base uh, subassignment, I can take just those objects that are over S and morphisms to be morphisms that are over S. So this would be category that I call uh, def s. So um, at the beginning of the lecture, I wrote uh, down uh, a ring that we want to integrate over. I said as first approximation, think of this as a variety, but we can now actually let x be a definable subassignment. And that's going to be the domain over which we do our integrals. So now I want to describe a ring that we get uh, of uh, the uh, constructible functions on this space. Uh, so let me do a couple of uh, piadic integrals uh, because we want to generalize that to this, this universal setting. So if we know what uh, piadic integrals look like, then we'll know what to put inside this ring. Um, <coughs> Okay, so let's uh, say this is some piadic integrals. Uh, so let's normalize measures so that uh, I'll just do things over ZP. Um, normalize measures so that the integers have volume one. And then uh, this is an additive far measure. And this is a subgroup of index uh, p to the n, so uh, its volume has to be 1 over p to the n. Uh, now, I want to make this universal. I don't know, this is the cardinality of the residue field. Uh, I don't know what that is until I know what field I'm going to be plugging in. Uh, so I can't just write a p here. Uh, I can't just put a P in here because I don't know what uh, the residue field is going to be. So the idea is whenever you come to something uh, where you don't know the answer, you just create a symbol for it and put the symbol over here. And then the specialization map later will take care of uh, picking the right prime uh, value over here. So we're just going to say motivically the answer is 1 over L to the N, where this is just a symbol uh, that is going to remember that, uh, well, eventually this is going to be the number of elements in the residue field. Um, okay, let's do another example. Let's take uh, dx 
dy over the set of xy is such that y squared equals x cubed plus x mod p. Uh, so these are elements uh, that are congruent to a point on an elliptic curve mod p. Uh, so I'll just write E for x and y now in the residue field. And it's clear that I can break this integral up into a, a sum over contributions in E. And I can, uh, for each of these, I'm just going to get a P zp squared dx dy. So the answer is going to be the number of the solutions on E. And then this uh, P again has, uh, the PZP has index P. So this is just going to be 1 over P. But I'm doing it twice. So I get 1 over P squared. OK, so this is going to be the integral. Uh, <clears throat> so again, the number of points on this curve is going to depend uh, very much on which uh, residue field we're picking. So again, I can't write down a particular number for what the uh, integral should be. What I have to do is introduce a symbol for, the, um, uh, for this particular curve. And then when it comes down, uh, when it comes time to specialization, I'll actually compute the number of solutions over the residue field and uh, plug that into the value for the motivic integral. So uh, from this example, it's pretty clear that we're going to need uh, not just a symbol for this particular curve, but we're going to need lots and lots of symbols. So we're going to have to have symbols for every variety, say, uh, that are going into the uh, definition of this ring. And then when we specialize it, we'll count points on those varieties over the residue field. So uh, the answer emotivically is going to be some symbol for E divided by L squared. Um, and then uh, just one more example. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't do the calculation, but suppose we have x to the n dx. I get uh, 1 minus 1 over p times 1 minus 1 over p to the n plus 1. So something like this. would be uh, the corresponding motivic integral. And so we see that our denominators in our ring are going to have to include, uh, uh, we're going to have to somehow invert this element L. We're also going to have to invert uh, things like this in our ring to get uh, general answers. So I won't give the precise definition now of this ring, but I'll just say, sort of the things that it's generated out of. Uh, it's basically the things I've given. So C of X is a ring. Cluckers and Lozer have two versions. There's a semi-ring version and a ring version. Uh, X is a definable Subassignment, say of type M, N, and R. And uh, we take K0, the group of subobjects So this is the Grotendieck group of type n plus n prime r. So 
the idea is I want to add symbols for everything over the residue field. And I do that by allowing more residue field variables and allowing the formulas to uh, now be inside, have this slightly larger type. So this n plus n prime is making allowance for all of these. I'm taking the Grotendieck group where I impose the, the relation uh, the symbol y plus y prime is equal to the union plus the intersection. This is just saying if I count uh, the number of points on one set and a second set, I should get uh, the number of solutions uh, in the union, uh, cardinality of the union plus uh, I've double counted the intersection. So. Um, and so we add that, we add a symbol L, we add its inverse. To take care of this t type of thing, we need to invert 1 minus L to the i for all i bigger than 0. And then we also allow uh, elements in the ring of the form L alpha, where alpha is a definable function from x to z. So this, uh, think of this as q to some power. Uh, that's the type of thing that we have here with the absolute value. OK, so I won't give the construction of the ring, but these are sort of the, um, the generators, if you want, of the ring. And uh, what we want, then, is a theory of integration that tells us how to abstractly integrate anything in this ring. And the really remarkable theorem, then, of Cluckers and Loeser is that now, so there's no piatic field here. There's nothing locally compact here or whatever. We just have this abstract ring that we've built up with these generators. The theorem is that there's a theory of integration uh, that works in this abstract setting that allows us to uh, integrate over functions to, uh, well, to get an answer that's, again, in one of these abstract rings. And they, what they show is that there's a uniquely defined functor going from uh, one ring. So if I have a morphism from x to y, I get a functor from the ring of x to the ring of y. And you interpret this functor as integration along fibers. And it's uniquely characterized by a long, long list of properties. Uh, so I certainly don't have time to go through all the properties, but there, I'll, I'll just uh, state a few without writing them up on the board. A Fubini, Fubini theorem should hold, so you uh, should be able to integrate uh, along variables in different orders and get the same answer. Uh, you should have a finite additivity of measure result. So if I have a set that's a disjoint union of two things, it should be the sum. Uh, it should be well behaved with respect to inclusions. So if I include one subassignment into another, uh, that should just be basically be uh, extension by zero in some sense. Um, there's uh, an axiom that talks about the volume of balls. Uh, I did uh, volume of balls here, and so you should get exactly this when you're computing the volume of a ball. Um, there's a change of variables formula. So if you express things differently in terms of different variables, you should get a change of variables. Um, things should behave well with respect to uh, things going down to the residue field, like this example here. Uh, so those are the types of axioms that, uh, that they give for this theory of integration. And then the theorem is that there exists a unique functor that satisfies all of these properties. So abstract integration exists, motivic integration exists. Okay, so that's, um, so it, it's uh, it, the most complicated part, of course, is, is showing that um, 
you know, if you follow these axioms, breaking things up in two different ways and two different orders, that you always get the same answer. That's, that's a very difficult and deep result that, because you don't have any underlying locally compact field to, to base this on. And so proving that that's really independent of the order in which you carry out these operations is a, is a deep and difficult result. Uh, but that's a theorem. And so we have this abstract theory of integration. And then, um, uh, and, then you, and then you have specialization maps. And so the whole theory was built up out of examples like these. And so what you do is whenever you have an L, uh, you specialize it to the number of elements in the residue field. Whenever you have something uh, attach a variety, say, over the residue field, uh, the specialization map is to count the number of elements, uh, uh, number of solutions in the residue field, and replace it by that number. Um, and uh, the same here, uh, you just replace everything by a Q and so forth. And that becomes the specialization map on motivic integration. The, the theorem then is that for any function that you want to integrate, uh, there's a restriction on uh, the characteristic. But if you're in sufficiently large characteristic, depending on the function, uh, it always specializes to the actual piatic integral that you would compute. Okay, so uh, I just have a few minutes left. Uh, I want to come back now to the fundamental lemma and say how that fits into this uh, general picture. So what you need to do to transfer the fundamental lemma from one characteristic to another is you need to express this fundamental lemma in terms of this type of data. Okay, so let's transfer it to characteristic zero. We must express it in terms of, think of it in terms, expressing it in terms of the ORD function, the angular component function, uh, this symbol L, symbols for Variety over the varieties over the residue field, and and so forth. You don't have to do any calculations of motivic integrations. You just need to be able to express it in this abstract setting. And once you can express it in this form, then you have this general theorem about motivic integration that says that you can move things from one field to another. So you never do a count calculation of any integrals in proving this result. You just show that you can express it in terms of this language, and then it's automatic that it moves from one characteristic to another. Um, so uh, I, I won't go through uh, the whole procedure of, of how to move, express the fundamental lemma. You just forget about the Hitchin vibration. That's, that's too complicated to, to express in terms of the ORD and the angular component function and so forth, you go back to the definition of the fundamental lemma um, and the transfer factors that are used in uh, setting that up. Uh, that's expressed in terms of uh, Galois cohomology, local class field theory, Tate-Nakayama duality, Brouwer groups, and so forth. You have to sort of, it, it's sort of reverse mathematics. You, you, I mean, most of the time you're trying to find interesting structures uh, in what you're studying, but this is just the reverse. You're, you're taking interesting structures 
and you're sort of stripping them of everything until they're just expressed in terms of the ORD function and the angular component function. So you, you want some gigantic formula. You don't care how complicated it is because you don't, you're not doing any computations. You just want to show that it's expressible in these terms. So for instance, I'll, I'll just give, uh, I see I'm out of time, but uh, for instance, to talk about a field extension, uh, you talk about, uh, So if you have a field extension, you're going to replace this with an explicit polynomial uh, whose root will generate the field extension, and you can work with the coefficients of the polynomial. You can't talk about field extensions, but you can talk about the characteristics, the, the coefficients of the polynomial, because those are elements of the field. You can talk about irreducibility and so forth. Uh, so then you identify E. with a vector space over the field F. Uh, and then to talk about things like the Galois group, that's going to be an automorphism of the field. Well, that's going to be a linear map. And so that can be written down as a matrix, an, an R by R matrix. And so elements of the Galois group get expressed as linear maps with uh, coefficients in the underlying field and so forth. And so you see the idea. You just, you just take every bit of structure that you have and expand it out so that you're not talking about field extensions or Galois groups or anything. And uh, so this, this can be done. It's a bit of a process, but not too difficult in the end. And, uh, and, and what it shows is that it can be expressed in this language and hence moved from one characteristic to another. Okay, thank you. <laughs>